the executive director and CEO of the American Geophysical Union. Since we last gathered together here in San Francisco, as we've been talking about this morning, there has been a sea of change in the landscape for science. Much of that change has greatly benefited the advancement of scientific discovery, though it has not been without its challenges. Come January, we will see a new incoming administration and a new Congress that will no doubt bring more change. While such uncertainty can breed concern, there is one thing that I can assure you of. No matter what happens, science has an essential role to play in our society and the world at large. It advances human understanding. It makes people's lives better. It creates and stimulates economies, and it protects us all from harm. As scientists, we are drawn to finding solutions for global challenges and working together to build a more sustainable and resilient future for all of us. During times of uncertainty and change, science and U.S. scientists must not hide. We have to be creative and we have to be passionate. We have to be committed and determined. We have to double our efforts to advance science and to do so with integrity and transparency that is the foundation of scientific discovery. Each of us and our friends and colleagues and those in the private sector must speak up and give voice to the value of science so that it may guide sound policy decisions and be used to improve the well-being of families, communities, and economies around the globe. Today's lecturer is a leader who understands and more importantly shares that passion. She shares our determination. She embraces our commitment to integrity and transparency. And she knows what a difference science can make when it is allowed to inform policy decisions. Since being sworn in as the 51st Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell has been an advocate for science and its ability to improve our lives. That's no surprise that when you consider what President Barack Obama said in nominating her, she is an expert on the energy and climate issues that are going to shape our future. She knows the link between conservation and good jobs. She knows that there's no contradiction between being good stewards of the land and our economic progress. I could spend an entire hour today talking about what the Secretary has accomplished in terms of responsible energy development or STEM education or numerous other topics. But instead, I will simply say, during her tenure at Interior, Secretary Jewell proved herself to be a dedicated champion for the power of science, and we are all better for her efforts. Please join me in welcoming U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that kind introduction. And uh, I got to tell you, it's great to be back here. It's great to see some of the posters and to satisfy that inner geek that uh, just loves this gathering of scientists from around the world. So it is a delight to be back here after a two year break. Uh, and I do appreciate. Chris's leadership of this organization, Margaret Lena, and your president right now, and uh, Eric Davidson, who's going to be taking over, and my own colleague, Suzette Kimball, the director of the U.S. Geological Survey, for her leadership as my colleague, not only in running the wonderful organization that is the USGS, but also being our scientific integrity officer for the Department of the Interior. So thank you so much, Suzette. So for my benefit and Suzette's, could those of you that are with the USGS just raise your hand? Wonderful. Thank you very much for your service and everything you've done. If you are uh, with the USGS and any other US government uh, entity, could you just raise your hand here? Thank you so much. I'll tell you, you know, it's um, since I took this job nearly four years ago, it seems like the one sort of common sport, particularly among politicians, is uh, to take on uh, people that work for the federal government, the feds. And yet, we would not be healthy as a society 
We would not be uh, working with people from around the world if it wasn't for people that work for the federal government. How many of you, yes, <laughs> yeah, let's give them a hand for that. So I know looking out across this room, and I, and I know from my work uh, as a regent at the University of Washington for nearly 12 years, I had to leave because of this job, how valuable U.S. taxpayers' contribution to all of your work is, and how valuable your work is back to them, and how important your work is to the continued health and well-being of people from across the United States of America. And that is a case that uh, I have been making, I will continue to make, but more importantly, you need to make as we look to the future. So it's great to be here, and I thought that I'd try and accomplish two things today. One is in the waning days of this administration, just uh, celebrate the great work that you've done, and thank you for your partnership, and the way that your work helps people like me shape our public policy, and how we need to make that case for the people that will sit in this chair, and Suzette's chair, and others in the future. You help us solve complex challenges and provide solutions to those challenges, whether it's national security or energy security or dealing with climate change or preparing our communities for natural disasters. That's what you do, and uh, thank God for it. There are a lot more healthy people on this planet because of the work that you do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I have seen and witnessed that I'm very proud of, of the work that has been done uh, under the Obama administration. And I also want to address the elephant in the room, which is where do we go from here? Got a little transition going on. I think you're probably aware of that. Uh, what does that mean? And um, what is my little call to action from you? And I will have one of those. You know, in President Obama's inaugural address in 2009, uh, he referenced a number of things. I, at the time, was running a, a retailer called REI. Some of you probably heard of it. Uh, it's a great job. But we had just experienced the worst holiday season in the cooperative's history, with sales that plummeted 20%. Running that business, I thought that uh, we could be entering the next Great Depression, and I didn't know what it meant. Uh, that is the circumstances that President Obama uh, took controls of the White House under. And in his first inaugural address, right alongside priorities like fixing the economy and looking at a renewable energy future to address the issue of climate change, he said this, we'll restore science to its rightful place. I'll tell you, these addresses, whether it's the State of the Union or the inaugural, uh, every single word is carefully thought through. And the president, uh, in his inaugural addresses, has written a lot of the material by himself. He wanted to send an important signal to this nation that science would play a critical role in his administration and, in fact, in the future of the United States. So what do you think he meant by rightful place? Where does science belong in government? And I would say it is abundantly clear from my position that science is foundational to government work. It is a key input in crafting public policy. How can we, or somebody in a position like mine, make decisions about land or water or wildlife if we don't actually understand what's going on? Second thing, besides science being foundational, is it has to be accessible. So the president launched the Open Data Initiative that's made vast quantities of data and scientific information out there and available to the public around the world, and I'm sure many of you uh, have appreciated that. He's also uh, recognized that making it accessible means allowing scientists and businesses and communities to draw on the data so that they can use it to advance their own ideas, their innovations, and their applications. And the last thing, besides being foundational, and accessible is it has to be translatable. And this is probably the hardest thing for scientists to fully understand. You can have the best science in the world, but if no one can decipher it uh, and sort of figure out how it might apply to real world problems, they won't understand the value. And that's a job for all of you. Now, some of the posters out there, pretty clear and obvious what the difference is. Some of the other posters out there, it's among yourselves, and you have to understand it and then translate it for people like me, and I do understand that. So science needs to be married with the human dimension. 
and communicated in a language that people understand. And over lunch, I was talking about, uh, you know, as an engineer myself, you know, poo-pooing a little bit. Um, communications majors, psychologists, not really recognizing the value. And now I realize I wish I'd had more of those classes. It would have been very, very helpful to me. So it's no coincidence, uh, for example, that one of the USGS's most popular tweets, which happened to be on climate change, was made popular because it was retweeted to 16 million followers by Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> so you guys are all rock stars to me. But I don't think any of you probably have 16 million followers. It's just a guess. I know I got a few thousand, and that's not many. So the president's words were important back in 2009, but more importantly, he followed it up with action. And I just want to share how that action has made a difference for one of the reasons I left the private sector to take this job, and that is to deal with, I would argue, the most pressing issue of our time, and that is climate change. I'll never forget the day that President Obama launched his climate action plan. It was a perfect day to illustrate global warming. Uh, it was an area with no wind and lots of sun at Georgetown University. But I'm proud of what we have done as a federal family since that time to implement the, amb the ambitious agenda he laid out in that plan. So first was around the climate data initiative. And that meant developing and sharing actionable science. So the White House made the federal government's climate relevant data freely available and accessible to the world. I felt this alongside Suzette when we both attended the GEO Summit, the, the Group on Earth Observations uh, Summit with over 100 countries in Mexico, and I'm sure a number of you were there, to hear firsthand about how valuable the data sharing was between all countries and how it moved your science forward. And when we're addressing something as big as climate change, we need to share. We created uh, open source platforms so that that extensive data on issues like coastal flooding, food resilience, and water could be shared and used by others. I know from my work in the private sector, the gathering data is relatively easy compared to turning that data into useful information. And that's where the open data initiative really made a difference. So, Organizations uh, and companies like Esri, for example, can take local planning data from a city planning manager and overlay that with NOAA's sea level rise data to help communities understand their infrastructure. What's at risk? How do they build out of harm's way? How do they create sensible policies for building that are going to uh, pass the test of time? That data is important to people like me who built a house in Seattle that is designed to a 9.2 earthquake because it is prone to that Cascadia subduction zone. A few of you probably know about that in here. Uh, the Seattle Fault runs just uh, a few blocks from my house. Um, the city is taking that data that's available and making smart decisions to, to plan it. So I was here just a few months ago and I took a little side trip over to Mountain View to meet with Google. You know, they've got this uh, you know, incredible innovation going on out there, and I heard a lot of different programs that they were doing that relate to the work in interior. But one thing that was particularly impressive is uh, something that I uh, just looked up again this morning, and that is the Google Earth Engine time lapse. How many of you have used that? Wow, okay, this is unique to this room. I mentioned this to others, and like the eyes glaze over, right? <laughs> So that, of course, is Landsat data brought to you by the USGS and NASA. Thank you, NASA, for your support in getting it up there, and USGS for interpreting that data. So I looked at an area that I'm going to be visiting later on this week, actually tomorrow, uh, working on the Colorado River. Uh, I looked at Las Vegas and Lake Mead. And you could see over 30 years what was happening as Las Vegas grew, what was happening as the drought impacts the Colorado River, what was happening to Lake Mead. And yes, it was fluctuating, but generally it was going down. And then I said, take me to Fire Island off of Long Island, New York. I want to look between 2010 and the present. I want to see what happened with Hurricane Sandy. So sure enough, I'm looking at that, and you're seeing the coast eroding and building and accreting and, and uh, getting displaced with that sand. And of course, that is natural systems. That's what barrier islands and coastal communities are supposed to do. And then you could see kablooey as Hurricane Sandy hit, and those dunes were blasted through, and the impact you could see behind it. And that is taking data that the USGS has had 
out of magnetic tapes in a warehouse and putting it in a format that's available to all people. That is the value of shared open government data and partnerships that can be developed with the private sector so that people that go out and look at that can see the intersection between humans, climate change, and the environment and understand the value of your work. So it's already changing our world in many ways, and we can't even anticipate, well, maybe you can, but I can't, where that's going to go in the future. But sharing uh, data is so critical, and taking just a bit of credit, I think I mentioned this two years ago when I spoke, the federal government is lousy at marketing. Um, maybe that's something, you know, with more business people in these jobs, uh, like, it, it, we might be able to do a better job of marketing, right? <laughs> Like when I go to the Weather Channel to figure out how on earth do I pack in a carry-on bag to go from San Francisco to Austin, Texas, to Las Vegas, to a, a snowstorm in uh, Jackson, Wyoming. I go, of course, to the Weather Channel. I figure it out. I uh, decide what I need. But that data is not brought to you by the Weather Channel. It's brought to you by NOAA. It's brought to you by NASA. It is interpreted by the Weather Channel and things that are brought to our pockets. So let's give the government credit for that. Let's take credit for some of those things. So the president's um, charge to us was to mainstream this data and also to mainstream climate resilience. He called for us as federal agencies to develop plans to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to a changing climate. I think about my job in the Department of the Interior as being in the forever business. When I look at the Organic Act of the National Park Service or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the charge to the USGS, it's not for this generation. It is for generations to come. That is the nature of the work that we do. We cannot manage our lands and water and wildlife and uphold our responsibilities to the indigenous communities of this country without thinking about what has come. So, an example, every single national park in the country now has a climate adaptation plan. You're not going to take that away from those national parks. Uh, historic Jamestown, which I visited a few years ago, had been devastated by a hurricane about 12 years ago. I think it was Hurricane Ivan that had flooded the island that makes out up historic Jamestown, an island that is no more than five feet above sea level, in an area where climate change tells us sea level will rise one to four feet over the next century, and we've already seen about eight inches. We have proactively removed cultural artifacts from the indigenous people and from the early uh, settlers. It was the first English colony uh, in the Americas to take place. That is planning for the future. That is the importance of your work in helping all of us shape that. We created grants to Alaska Native communities who are on the front lines of climate change in that part of our planet that is warming twice as fast as uh, down here in the lower 48. These are communities which it will be life and death to. They may need to relocate next week. They may need to relocate 10 years from now, but they are being inundated uh, right now. And that is a part of all of our job and our work. We need to figure out how to focus limited landscape restoration dollars on the areas where it makes the most sense. So this morning I'm listening to the news. I know there's a rain event coming tomorrow here, so bring your umbrellas out, right? Thanks to your good work, I know that. Um, I also know that uh, they're worried about flooding in Santa Cruz and mudslides because of forest fires that had happened in that area in the past. Because of your work and because of uh, our planning ahead, we now know where the vulnerable areas are to forest fires that could impact, for example, communities or impact water supply systems so that when we take the limited dollars that we have, we can focus it on the areas that would have the greatest risk and, of course, uh, the greatest impact. Again, as a business person in here, you want to make efficient use of your resources. Businesses operate that way. If we start speaking in the language of business, we will help a new administration understand why these investments are so important. Hurricane Sandy cost all of us, the taxpayer, $60 billion. $60 billion. Think of what you could have done with that in advance to do a little prep work. Uh, in 2014, we had eight weather events, each of which cost over a billion dollars. All of your work is a bargain compared to that if we start getting smarter about uh, 
how we invest out of harm's way. For Interior, Hurricane Sandy and the money that came with the restoration efforts gave us an opportunity to share the importance of the science that you work on in planning for the future. So the USGS uh, sensibly and proactively flew LIDAR in advance of the storm. And then of course did it again after the storm and could share those lessons of what happened from Hurricane Sandy with all kinds of people from local land managers to states to, uh, to land managers like myself. And what that showed was the value of natural habitat, natural barriers, like the Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge that took 22 miles of debris from the storm but protected the communities behind. Or the uh, Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge in Delaware, which uh, had seen steady beach erosion because of human development and so on in the area. The wildlife refuge itself was set up largely as a freshwater habitat, but that was not natural. And so learning from the Hurricane Sandy, we applied um, some of the same techniques and rebuilt the dunes that should have been there, replanted sedges and native grasses, allowed that freshwater marsh to return to a saltwater marsh habitat. The animals came back much quicker than we thought, from tortoises to, um, to fish to, uh, to avian species. And they've already had a storm since that was put in and it protected the community behind. So, yeah, you can clap for that. <laughs> so let me say when you have a president-elect of the United States that's in the real estate development business, your science matters. Your science matters. Nobody wants to build a building in harm's way if they've got good data that tells them where they can build it out of harm's way. And uh, there are a lot of examples for that that will help support your work, I'm confident, uh, in the future. We cannot make smart investments without sound science. And business people will understand that. So what's next? Well, there's countless examples, uh, of course, of how science has helped guide this administration. But I do want to spend a little bit of time addressing that elephant in this room. Uh, I know there's a lot of uncertainty here um, from the election and from the announcements that have come out since that time. Uh, I've been to a lot of employee meetings recently, trying to connect with people before I'm done to thank them for their good work. And they're wringing their hands a little bit about what are our, what are our budgets going to be like? What kind of programs do you think we're going to see? You know, are our priorities going to change? And I imagine universities are having some of those discussions like, am I going to be able to fund my research? Can I support my postdocs? Am I studying uh, the right material? Am I going to be able to pay off those student loans? Right? A few of those. Um, so, I mean, it's not productive for me to speculate what the next administration will do. I think it's fair to say we've all seen a lot of mixed signals. Um, but what I can do is give you a bit of unsolicited advice about what I think all of you uh, can and should be doing. When you sit in a chair like mine, you come in with a set of ideas and assumptions. And there's a way uh, of sitting in these chairs that will dump a bucket of ice water quickly on any ideology you walk in with. And that is when uh, you meet the brass tacks of trying to oversee 20% of nation's land and the outer continental shelf and work with tribal communities that have been impacted by climate change. And you say, oh, wow, uh, this is big. And I have to be part of the solution. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen to people that step in to the cabinet of the next administration and, and understand the importance of their work the gravity of their work and the importance of your work in um, supporting what it is they're expected to do. Because none of us set out not wanting to do a good job. We all want to do a good job. We've also got great validators for your work. Like, for example, the Pope. So he said recently, never before has there been such a clear need for science to be at the service of a new global ecological equilibrium. Now, I'm not a Catholic, but I've read the Pope's encyclical on climate change and inequality. It's an incredible piece of work that lays out a very clear case. And I will say to all of you that are involved in science that as somebody that came from the private sector into the public sector, that this truly is the highest calling. I know a number of you make sacrifices. You work very hard. Probably don't make as much as you might be able to make in the private sector, at least for some of you. But that's not why you do the work. 
You do the work because of the difference you can make, and you can make so much more of a difference working in the public sector, working at a university, sharing your knowledge, building knowledge with the young people that come behind you that helps our planet in ways that we probably all don't even understand. So number one is I urge you to stay the course and to keep up your commitment to your work. It's going to be very important. Second thing I urge you to do is make your voices heard and make them relevant to the people that you're talking to. So yes, that does mean translating your science into language we can all understand, like I said at the beginning. And uh, you know, we would hope, I would hope, based on what I know from this job and what I knew before, that we would still not be having to make the case uh, that climate change is real and that humans have uh, contributed to it. But late last week, I sat on an airplane between El Paso and Dallas next to a gentleman who supported the president-elect in a significant way and was very skeptical about climate change. And so it was, uh, he did figure out what I did. You know, it takes 20 questions or something like that, but eventually they, they find it out. But he was genuinely interested in talking about this. So I talked about your work. I talked about the science. I talked about the uh, information that has been translated like through you know, Google Earth uh, time lapse, for example. And I talked to him about Merchants of Doubt. Some of you have probably read that book, maybe more in this room than any other room. Um, but he was paying attention to you know, the, the one scientist left in the world that says that climate change has not been, is not real or hasn't been caused by humans. And uh, I actually suggested he read the book, which I think he actually might do. He's a smart guy. He's run a business for a long time. He had legitimate concerns. But when we treat people that have a different point of view with respect, we allow them to share their points of view, and then we bring um, things that are very credible and on the ground that, we can, that people can relate to. It does begin to move the meter. And that, I would argue, is all of our job. And as I said, whomever sits in my chair is going to quickly realize, as a land manager, we've had massive wildfires, some of uh, the largest in our nation's recorded history just in the last uh, 10 years or so. We've got a massive drought, and of course, even though it's a bit rainy right now in Northern California, you feel it acutely here. We feel it in the Colorado River, um, seeing the largest drought period over 17 years that we've seen since we've been recording information over the last 100 years, and one of the most profound droughts that we've had over the 1,200 years showing in the paleo record. Uh, they will come quickly to realize the impact of invasive species or the impact of native species like the pine bark beetle that has wiped out many forests within the Rocky Mountains just because of a tiny increase in, uh, in temperature that has caused those uh, beetles to thrive. And I'm pretty confident when they sit in this chair that uh, they will understand the value of your work. But it's up to you to help them understand that. It's up to you to create opportunities to get out your word out in the public domain so that it is uh, uh, understood. So when I was at REI, I used to call on members of Congress and I thought, is this a good use of my time? Coming here to Washington DC, you know, begging to get in to see a member and doing these meetings. And I thought, am I really getting anywhere? Even when I would call with a competitor like uh, Eastern Mountain Sports, for example, you might get a little more attention because here's two competitors coming together saying, you know, public lands are important. Um, we used to go in there talking about public lands are important for their conservation values and the connection of people to nature and how we need nature to help fuel our souls. But that really didn't work so well going back to 2000, 2001. So we invested in a study that said, instead of talking about the green of conservation, let's talk about the green of money. So you probably didn't know that the outdoor recreation industry is a $646 billion industry, which is bigger than or about the same size as far, pharmaceuticals, motor vehicles, and motor vehicles parts combined. Who knew, right? 6.1 million people employed. And just like your jobs, those jobs count. Uh, your jobs count. So let's translate the science into dollars and cents that people can relate to. And that is not that hard to do. And that is an opportunity, I think, Chris, for AGU. So when you go to Washington, D.C., you're not talking just in uh, your world. You're talking in their world. You're putting it in terms that they can understand. And uh, it's made a big difference. 
And I think the one phrase that I remembered immediately and I have never forgotten from those early days of calling on members of Congress to make the pitch for uh, public lands is, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> right? If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. You don't want to be on the menu. Public investments in your work is critical to the public, but we need to make that case. So uh, that is your job. And I applaud many of you, uh, the open letter from 2,300 scientists, including a bunch of Nobel Prize winners, to the president-elect and the new Congress to make sure that federal agencies receive adequate funding for their research, uh, that universities receive adequate funding for their research, and that jobs like mine are filled by officials that have a track record of respecting science. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> So we'll keep making that case. And um, when I get an opportunity to talk to my successor, uh, I will certainly be making the case, as we are right now, to the people in the, in the transition team that we're working with. So uh, my colleague Suzette Kimball says, you know, she can make this generalization because she is uh, among your ranks. And that is that scientists' natural inclination can be a bit introverted and focused on your work, right? You, you work on some very complicated and deep topics, and I get that. So uh, some of you, though, are like Bill Nye, the science guy. And you need to help your colleagues that aren't inclined that way to get the word out. I say Bill Nye uh, because I'll tell a quick story. I know I'm, I'm running a little bit long, but I was at the Everglades with a group of young people who were stud had been. They were from inner city schools in uh, Miami. And they, for a year, had been studying the ecosystem for, of the Everglades and its, uh, the impacts of climate change and the importance of the Everglades ecosystem to climate change. So I was there to meet with the kids. We were at the Anhinga Trail. The president was there, and I was going to be with him as he gave a major address on climate change. So the president was going to go on an airboat tour, and I was with the kids, and they were using sponges to talk about what the, what the Everglades did uh, in, in sucking up uh, carbon and sucking up water and how important that was. And um, there was bad weather, and so the president's trip on the airboat was canceled. So he needed someplace to go. I did have uh, my first of several fights with the Secret Service because they wanted to bring him to the Anhinga Trail and they wanted to get rid of the kids. And I said, well, you know, that's not going to play with the President of the United States. I guarantee you he cares a lot about children, so we have to find a way. So I, I did, after a little tussle, um, convince them that the kids could stay. And to the kids, I said, put out your arms like Anhinga wings. And the Secret Service was wanding them all down, I guess, for weapons, uh, because they're, they're fourth graders, and you know how bad fourth graders can be. Um, at any rate, point is, the president's entourage pulls up. The kids don't know that he's coming. Uh, the door opens from the big black car, and out pops Bill Nye the Science Guy. And they're like, Bill Nye! Bill Nye! They thought they got wanted and all of that just for Bill Nye. And then the president gets out and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Anyway, as you know, science can be fun. Your work is fun. Your work is important. And uh, however you get the word out, I hope that you do it with gusto and enthusiasm. I hope you listen to your young colleagues who are on Snapchat and uh, or, or whatever is si subsequent to Snapchat. You can shout it out to me. I'm not sure what it is, being an old fart myself. But uh, engage with your young colleagues who know how to communicate to today's audience. Go uh, snuggle up to those communications majors and psychology majors that can help you understand the human dimension and talk about it, to talk about your good work. Respect them as I didn't uh, to the degree that I wish I had when I was uh, a student myself. And fight the disinformation and the rumor that is out there and has a clear pathway to get out there with facts that people can relate to. And don't be afraid to leverage those validators out there, whether it's the Pope or Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, they got more followers than you do, and they probably always will. So how do you work with them, too? Sorry, but they'll have more than I will, too. So I would also encourage you, as you've done with me, to hold your leaders accountable at every level. Uh, we have, across the federal family, established scientific integrity policies consistent with what President Obama asked us to do. Department of Interior was first to the table in 2011. We've continued to uh, refine it. We have a code of conduct. 
for uh, scientific integrity. We have a process in place to investigate scientific uh, misconduct complaints. That genie's not going back in the bottle either. Suzette Kimball has led that effort for us, and we just, again, this morning, put out, out a reminder of the scientific integrity policy. My successor would be crazy to say, oh, never mind, right? So that's out there across all the federal agencies, and uh, that work will help ensure that science remains uh, in its rightful place at the table, not just now, but for years to come. So. I want you to know that I am optimistic about the future. I'm optimistic that you will make the case for your work. I'm optimistic that my successor and successors to all the jobs in the federal government will quickly realize how valuable science is. Uh, yeah, a little speech earlier, a raucous speech from Governor Jerry Brown. What a hero he is. He's my hero too, I, I just want you to know. But California has led the world in things like uh, emissions from cars. My husband grew up uh, in Southern California where uh, in Sierra Madre to begin with he couldn't go outside for recess because the air quality was so bad. California clean that up. California is leading the United States of America on renewable energy standards and we just signed an MOU with the governor yesterday uh, on a commitment to work together on renewable energy between Interior and the state of California. The Paris Climate Agreement, nearly 200 countries signed on to that, and the entire world was moved because a few Pacific Island nations stepped forward and said, you know, our average height of our country is six feet above sea level, and we are going underwater, and the lenses of fresh water we depend on are already being inundated by king tides, and we need you, world, to join us in changing our carbon footprint and reducing our impact. These are, this is the world, folks. And uh, we are a competitive nation. We like to win. We have uh, a president-elect who likes to win. We cannot win without good science. And everybody that sits in these jobs will recognize that very quickly. So I'm optimistic because of your work. I'm optimistic because of the way you engage young people in STEM fields and you encourage them to take on careers in science. I'm optimistic because I spent several days floating on the Colorado on the River on the Grand Canyon, in the Grand Canyon with the USGS and a group of high school students who were doing incredible science, led by a scientist from the USGS and understanding how ecosystems work, how much we can learn from snipping the tail off a lizard and understanding what it's eating and what does that mean for the future of the Colorado River watershed and how should we shape uh, releases from the Glen Canyon Dam to impact those ecosystems. It's complicated, it's exciting, and young people are really excited about it and they're also willing to tell their friends about it. So, whether you're supporting STEM education, whether you're mentoring young colleagues, whether a young person, you are a young person just starting out, I just want to encourage you to keep the faith, to use the tools that you have, to use that incredible brain that you have, to share the importance of the work that you do. Our planet depends on it. Our country depends on it. And I'm so proud of the work that you do and the opportunity that I've had to serve as Secretary of the Interior to get just that much closer to your work. So. I leave this job with an incredible appreciation of all of you. I look forward to continuing to be a champion for your work, to be a rabble rouser from the outside, which I can do with a little uh, less control than I do right now. Um, and I look forward to that. So thank you so much for all you do. And Chris, come on up and we'll take a few questions. Thanks. Maybe not have as many Twitter followers as Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio, but I bet he's never gotten a standing ovation with this many people in the room. So thank you. For kudos that. to you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, you did a really, really effective job of telling us about how to translate the the science and the data into business terms. Mm -hmm. 
and into terms that people that are non-scientists can understand. But we're, there's also a lot of talk around the room about how do we also, though, make the case that sometimes the very fundamental research is needed before you can get to the knowledge you have that then you can translate into business terms. What advice would you give us to actually maintain that commitment? to fundamental research, which used to be something that the business community advocated for a lot, but over the last decade or so, they have not been quite as vocal about. You know, this is a really important point, and I'd say that um, all audiences are not going to understand that the building blocks of science that are necessary that lead to many of the discoveries that we now take for granted. Um, but there are enough of them out there that do understand it, mm -hmm. and they should become validators for you. So uh, I gather that the president-elect is meeting with uh, the tech sector, I think today, or, or met with some of them yesterday. People like Elon Musk, that I guarantee you has more Twitter followers than I do, um, or Bill Gates, uh, uh, will understand the value of that work. And I think those validators are really critically important. Come up with some examples. Uh, you know, the, and I know that isn't, this isn't the work uh, of the AGU, but you know, pharmaceuticals, um, which are so important to business success in this country and a, and a major part of our export industry, would not happen if we didn't do the basic building blocks uh, that led to to that, and you've got many examples in the earth sciences where that's true. So I think um, using those examples, um, can have some, there's a bottle of water up there if you want it. Yeah, um, <laughs> I didn't drink out of it. I promise. Uh, using those examples <laughs> yourself is is going to help uh, translate it. So it's still got to be brought to a level that the individual you're talking to can relate to. And if you're talking to a member of Congress, do a little work uh, on their state. Figure out what's important to their state. Figure out what fundamental research went into that that translates to something that they can relate to today. Have university researchers, and every one of your universities has people that are working in Washington, D.C. to keep uh, basic research going and make that case. Uh, the other thing I will say that President Obama realized is that uh, when he did the, uh, the ARA Act, the, the stimulus package, he realized that your jobs were also jobs that were important and that counted. And I think making that case is also really important. It's not just building bridges and roads, it's building the infrastructure necessary to further our scientific knowledge, and I think you can make that case effectively. So I'm going to ask you one more question. <clears throat> See, you choked me up. Yeah. So inspirational. <laughs> um, and then we'll open it up to the, to the audience. So one of the things that I got stopped about on the street last night was a great concern about preserving the data that you just sat, that you just cited, the Landsat data, the climate data, the NOAA data, NASA data, this rich repository of open government data we have. And people are starting to put it on their own servers. They're looking for partners to put it in the cloud. There was just an article about this in the Washington Post. Can you address that issue a little bit and, and, and whether how concerned should we be, how concerned should the community be about making sure that that rich trove of data is still available and accessible? OK. Well, I don't think you can take an open data initiative and say, all, all of a sudden, we're going to close that data open and publicly available and people have been using it means that there are actually a, a lot of people that depend on that data. And so, you know, it, it's fine to copy it and put it on servers, but I don't think you need to panic. Um, I, when a, an organization like Google, which is unbelievably powerful, uh, talks to the value of the data they get from that open government initiative, or when companies like the Weather Channel come out and say, wait a minute, we rely on that data to bring you the weather forecast every day so people like Sally can pack her bags before she leaves on a trip. Um, these are things that the public will demand. So I wouldn't panic. Uh, I do know the business mind. I know how it thinks uh, because I, I, I come from that world. And there are a lot of people that are dependent on the data that you have created, on the data that you use for the work that they do. So uh, by all means, uh, you know, if you want to back it up and download it, that's great, but I don't think you have to panic 
about any of that. There's certainly been no indication that I have seen uh, that would suggest that we're going to look in the rearview mirror and try and squelch the science that's out there. It's just too important fundamentally to the success of our economy and the success of our nation. Thank you. We're going to go to the mic over here. Please introduce yourself. Um, <clears throat> I'm James Biela. I'm here as a freelance science writer. And I um, want to tell Sally that I sat on her bench at Lilywap and um, thank her there for supporting me. I hope she'll support me here today. Um, uh, according to Ask an Attorney, uh, a number of us had have concerns over a number of years with the way the USGS is doing their earthquake hazard maps, which have transposed a dimensionless number into an annual frequency of earthquakes. And according to Ask an Attorney, there's a Data Quality Act, which is supposed to guarantee to us that all the federal agencies um, use the best and accurate methods, particularly if they're discussing probabilities and other things. And um, so I can foresee that we could be in a situation where we'll all have to fight that this act remain in force and that it be followed. Can you share some insight into um, where the future guarantees on, on data quality, will they remain in place? So I think the short answer to that is um, in a representative democracy, people will respond to the things that are important to their constituents. And that's where your voices are really important. No one will undo something that makes sense, particularly with regard to uh, data quality and integrity, if uh, elected officials are told that this is important to us. I mean, there's no indication that I've had that, that uh, and I you know, couldn't even speculate that uh, any of that would be undone. It would just be shocking to me that it would be because it is in everyone's best interest to have good information out there. So I'd say um, make your feelings known. You know, write to your members of Congress. Put this on their radar. Uh, and that will help give those who are charged with implementing this the kind of uh, support that they need to continue that work. Suzette, is there anything you'd want to add to that? Are we? You're okay. Yeah, okay, so Suzette says for the USGS, we fully support the Information <laughs> Quality Act. Just to give you a sense, uh, there's about, in, in the Department of the Interior, there's 71,000 employees, and only about 120 of us are political appointees. The rest are all career staff. This audience, when people ask people who's with the USGS, the only uh, non-career staff person is Suzette that would have raised her hand, and she was a career staff for uh, the lion's share of her career and could go back into that if she chose. So um, there are loud voices that will continue to uh, be supportive of, uh, of data integrity. Go over here to the left. Uh, my name, hello, my name is Timothy Dillon. Uh, Madam Secretary, I owe a lot of where I am today in my scientific career to relationships between the Department of Interior and nonprofits and NGOs, such as the Student Conservation Association. And as both a former crew member and multi time crew leader, uh, I'm greatly concerned that they might be the first people to see cuts in funding for students to get out into nature. And really, that is a fundamental part of growing new scientists from high school education. Is there anything that you can do or anything that um, you would recommend as safeguards to protect the funding for those programs and initiatives? Yeah, Timothy, thanks. Thanks for your work uh, with SCA. This has been a personal passion of mine. Uh, the entire time that I've been in Interior, and it was in my, in my job before. And, and the short answer is absolutely. I think one of the key things that has happened uh, just during the time I've been in Interior is Youth Conservation Corps crews are on the radar across all of our land management agencies as a very effective way to leverage dollars to get work done. So um, if you're about efficiency, using uh, youth crews is really important. Second, we have raised over $20 million in private money that has supplemented federal government money to do this work. Uh, I've talked to, in fact, um, in Austin, Texas, where I'll be tomorrow, I'll be with the Texas uh, Conservation Corps group and a number of students that have gone through SEA as well as uh, AmeriCorps and VISTA um, that have been doing this work. And I, I've heard from so many different youth corps that the work that we've done and the 75,000, or it's actually 76,000 young people that have been put to work over the last three years, so it'll be 
hopefully 100,000 over a four-year period of time, um, are ambassadors like you for these programs. And so are the land managers. So I don't think we're going to go away from that. And so many young people's interest is sparked through being in the outdoors in some way. And these Youth Conservation Corps crews reach into communities where perhaps their parents hadn't taken them into the outdoors. And they develop a connection to land and the landscapes that will never leave them. So uh, I don't see that going backwards. I think that there is renewed confidence in what I would call the CCC 2.0. Uh, and that involves Youth Conservation Corps crews around the country. So thanks for raising awareness for this whole group about the importance of that work. Um, I think we're going to be fine. Thank you for your work. Go right here. Hello, my name is Susan Huff. I'm a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. So first, thank you for your leadership. Um, I've been involved for a long time, interested in written communication for a non-specialist audience. I've written, done a lot of writing as official expression and, and as unofficial expression. And I very much appreciated your point that basically scientists suck at marketing. And so, <laughs> pardon my language. The federal government does too, yeah. Yeah, so we put together great products, but we don't really do a good job of, of marketing them. And so I've been struck by the importance of working with people whose business is marketing uh, books and other publications and know how to get them out there. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for that. I, there is, people do still read books. Books are important. It's been an increasingly uphill battle to get approval to do that sort of project, even if I'm making no money on it. Mm. And so the question, I'm not to put you on the spot with a very specific personal question, but you know, how do we effectively establish those partnerships with people who can help us get the word out? Mm. That's a good question, Susan. <laughs> Thank you for, Thank you. thanks for your work to translate. Uh, into plain English, uh, the work that so many people in this room do. Um, part of it, I think, is working with your university partners uh, and working with people whose business it is to communicate, to do marketing. I mean, uh, I know in the University of Washington, while I was a regent there, we did something very painful for a university, but we created the College of the Environment, which took uh, ocean fishery sciences and uh, atmospheric sciences and forestry and others and sort of merge them together, but also has joint appointments with um, the business school, uh, the law school, um, communications and so on, so that a professor of communications or of marketing could also have a joint appointment in the College of the Environment and their work would be to market, if you will, the science that's being done around the environment. and. Um, so I, you know, I can't speak specifically to sort of the federal budgets and what was requested or declined because I'm not in the weeds to that extent, but I think that uh, those sort of logical connections between your work and people that are, um, you know, are uh, expert in getting the word out should do a mind meld. I think uh, the, I mean, I'm not sure how the USGS got the attention of Leonardo DiCaprio and his 16 million <laughs> followers, but I think you should do more of that. That's very cost effective. <laughs> um, so I, it's finding those odd bedfellows uh, to, to come together um, to captivate that, that information or that understanding. Bill Nye is another uh, you know, great resource uh, to leverage your information and get it out there. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It's just uh, the creative talents of individuals that know effectively how to communicate with the masses. I also think, again, you know, as we see perhaps more business people in cabinet positions, this is all the language of business. It's reputation, it's marketing, it's, it's making the case for your work. Um, and uh, you know, I think you will find in many cases perhaps a willing audience uh, if they can take credit for the work that you do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we need to get the word out. So uh, there are a few suggestions, but thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Thanks. Go right here. Hi, I'm James Balog with the Extreme Ice Survey. And um, I'm, I want to circle back around to one of your core points uh, and take a somewhat contrarian view. Um, Fact-based reality has very limited eff efficacy with ideological fanatics who are proud of their indifference to facts. We have a room full of fact-based people 
there's a there's a whole city full of them about to invade uh, Washington or certain key parts of Washington. So in addition to producing more facts that they'll be eager to reject, what else is the single most important lever of resistance that we can use to push back against these guys? People react to things that they believe are in their own best interest. If they believe that a denying climate change or anthropogenic climate change is in their own best interest, they're going to continue to promote that. If you can translate your work into things that they care about, that they can relate to, then all of a sudden the facts will take over the non-facts. And I think that that's really important. I, I have said to many people about my work that um, I use a lens that is not in the here and now. It's not for my generation. It is for generations yet to come. We don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And what are the decisions we're making today that are going to impact uh, not just our children, children's children, and so on. Um, when we make a case of how the decisions we make today will impact people's children, you get to them in a really visceral way. And I don't think we should be bashful about doing that. Uh, and I think that there are many examples of the here and now where people can see how they're being impacted today. And I think that's, that's really important. And um, that's why I think these validators that people do pay attention to are really important. It's frustrating that you know, movie stars have a lot more credibility on science work than scientists do. But you know, so be it. Uh, how do you work with them to get your message out? And in a representative democracy, in uh, a competitive uh, climate, People want to win. How do you enable them to win? And if you can craft a path forward where paying attention to the right stuff and not the wrong stuff is a path to win, I think that uh, people will come around. So, um, you know, that's going to be all of our job, mine included, to make that case. But I do think that case can be made. And I think for uh, people that are, are going into jobs that put them in touch with others from around the world, they will recognize the importance of the role that they play within the United States and um, the difference that we make through our work uh, and how it shapes the world around us. And I think it will be very difficult for them to ignore facts uh, or to continue to perpetuate bad, uh, bad data. But, Thank you. you know, it's, uh, it's all of our job, right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll go right here, please. Hi, my name is Daniel Ziskin. I'm from Colorado. Uh, you made a great... Uh, case about the importance of advocacy from within federal government for, um, for different uh, interests, and we're the scientists that are beneficiaries of your championship. Um, month after month, uh, we watched the, uh, our Native American brothers and sisters suffering at Standing Rock mm -hmm. without an advocate in uh, the federal government, or that's how it appeared. How could you have let this happen? You know... <laughs> The conclusion reached by the Army Corps in Standing Rock was to not issue a permit to cross uh, Lake Oahe. Uh, there were many people behind the scenes and up front um, that were helping the Army Corps understand its responsibility in consultation with tribes, the risk that tribes felt, uh, particularly Standing Rock, but there are other tribes downstream as well, uh, of their water supply and the importance of doing a full environmental impact statement and analysis. That is the conclusion that the Army Corps reached. Um, there are a lot of people behind the scenes that played a role in uh, raising awareness of these issues. I'm very proud of my colleagues within the Department of the Interior and the role that they played, as well as um, the doubling of the police force that we did uh, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs on the Standing Rock Reservation to keep people safe and to respond to emergencies in the camp and to, to facilitate the movement, if needed, of a winter camp to Standing Rock territory. Um, so there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that everyone um, does not have visibility to. I am incredibly proud of the way Indian country came together uh, in an unprecedented display of solidarity for the importance of recognizing not only water and protecting water, but also sacred sites that a, a, a state archaeologist may not know in the same way that a tribal uh, person would know. So yes, it was uh, thousands of people 
over many months to make that case. But ultimately, the conclusion that was reached, which is not to grant an easement and to launch a full environmental impact statement, I think uh, Dave Archambault from the Standing Rock Tribe and the other tribal leaders that were there would say that uh, at the end of the day, they uh, got the kind of analysis they were looking for. Now, um, you know, can that change? It can, but there is a, because of the hard work of a lot of folks, a very clear pathway laid out to do that environmental analysis that will be highly visible if us choose not to do that. And uh, so, uh, you know, how could we let that happen? I'm actually very proud of what did end up happening at the end of the day. Well, you're very popular, and I'm going to call for the last question okay. because we know that we have to uh, get you on your way as well. So we'll go right here in the, in the middle. Hi, my name is uh, Rose Vining. I am an undergraduate researcher at the University of Arizona, and my question is actually related to the DAPL pipeline. I know it's been on a lot of people's minds, um, and that it is mostly a private sector, in the private sector, and the government has recently been getting involved in it. I would like to thank you for getting involved. Um, I know we've been calling for it for a long time, and you finally did it, and I think that's great. Um, my question is whether when you make those environmental environmental impact statements. You're working closely with scientists like me, um, environmental uh, environmentalists, people, even sociologists, to see how this would impact the indigenous tribes, and whether or not we're making solid um, decisions on the risks of the, putting the pipeline there, or putting the pipeline wherever else it will end up going. OK. Um, so let me just first say the Army, the US Army, through its uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is the permitting agency, so they will be conducting the environmental impact statement. Uh, the U.S. Department of the Interior recommended um, some time ago, uh, early last year, that they do a full environmental impact statement. The EPA did the same thing. They had chosen to go forward without one and have now decided that they do need one. An environmental impact statement is an open public process and everyone is encouraged to weigh in. So if you feel strongly about uh, that it is your opportunity as a citizen to weigh in, as a citizen with some good expertise, I would encourage you to do that. It can be done in open public meetings that they will hold. It can be done in writing. All of that must be taken into account in an environmental impact statement process, or a NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act uh, process. So there will be an opportunity to do that. That is exactly what the Corps has signed up to do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there will be lawsuits, and you know, I can't predict the outcome of those or, or whether they will occur, but that is exactly what the Corps has said it will do. And, and for any of you that um, care about this, I would encourage you to weigh in, because it will make a difference. We do uh, thousands of environmental impact statements over the course of, of time in the federal government. Any time there is a federal action uh, or an action on federal land that's involved, like the Army Corps and the crossing of uh, the Lake Oahe Reservoir, uh, it triggers a NEPA process. And um, so that is your opportunity to weigh in, and I encourage you to do that. I'll also say, and this is uh, getting in the weeds, but um, if this was a transmission line or a natural gas line, it would have had a FERC or Federal Energy Regulatory Commission process it would have gone through that looked at the entire line. Because this is a crude oil pipeline, it doesn't have the same requirements. So a lot of the pipeline was built just by working with private landowners. It was the action crossing a federal property, which is the Oahe Reservoir, that triggered even this analysis. But if it hadn't done that, uh, it wouldn't have required the analysis. Um, so it's up to you as a citizen to weigh in on that process. It's up to the Corps to notice it in the Federal Register. It will be out there. And uh, I encourage you uh, to take a stand in this and, and to share your expertise. As I'm sure the, the tribal uh, archaeologists will, uh, tribal historians, uh, state folks, industry, and so on. They have a voice at the table. And remember, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Please, Please thank Secretary Joel, an inspiration to all of us, and that shows that business leaders are also science geeks. Exactly. Thank you.